The Dropout has just finished airing and the majority of audiences thoroughly enjoyed exploring the dramatic rise and enormous downfall of Elizabeth Holmes, Sonny Balwani, and their infamous company, Theranos. However, The Dropout was only eight episodes long and had to leave an enormous amount of the story on the cutting room floor. Some of the stories and characters absent from the show may have used their enormous power, influence, and money to remove themselves from the show or to have a milder, dialed down version of themselves appear in the dropout. So today we're going to be exploring just some of the storylines and characters that didn't make it into the final product and some of the surprising details that were exposed after the dropout had already wrapped. So straight out of the gate, I'm going to tell you one of the really funny things that was left out of the show and was out left out of bad blood because John Carreyrou didn't find this out till after the book had gone to press, so it couldn't be included. But that was Elizabeth Holmes's revenge video game that she created to hit back at John Carreyrou. So she had people at Theranos create the haters gonna hate version 1.5 of Space Invaders that basically had John Carreyrou as the invader, the baddie, and also the Ebola virus because previously Holmes had tried to help with the Ebola epidemic in Africa and she had tried to be the testing partner for that because she wanted the the money from the government and it didn't work out because of course it didn't work and she had the little mini lab at the bottom of the screen and it would shoot out these cure cartridges at Carriru and the Ebola virus. So a lot of people asked what was going on at the company if nothing worked, but apparently this. So there were some other people that were really instrumental in helping homes and we just got a glimpse of those people or we got a really dialed down version of them and some of them are absent completely from the dropout. So the first example of this would be the Safeway CEO, Steve Bird, who was a huge fan of Holmes. And although we did get a little glimpse of the Safeway delegation when Walgreens was there, they aren't mentioned at all. And Walgreens was the exclusive drugstore partner, but Safeway was the exclusive grocery store, and Safeway actually had their employees' blood being tested by Theranos, and although Walgreens did have the wellness clinics, they kind of just put some paint and new signs, whereas Safeway actually took huge amounts of space in their stores and had them completely redesigned. They spent millions and millions and millions on these in-store wellness centers. A really large part of why Steve Bird was asked to retire from CEO of Safeway is because these wellness centers sat empty for ages because obviously Holmes kept pushing back the timeline and they had already worked the revenue from the wellness centers into their targets for the quarter. So all the Safeway executives and board and everyone was being denied their bonuses because they hugely were not hitting those revenue targets because you know the wellness centers weren't even functioning. So David Boyce, while he is shown in the dropout and he's not shown in the best light, there was way more to this than than they're showing on the show. We wouldn't be here, spend all this time and effort if the, uh, we've got a technology. So why don't we discuss it more freely? Yeah, be, because it's trade secret. That's why. And. Allegedly, he was the one that really was behind, you know, the following and a lot of the underhanded tactics because all of the letters that people got, like threatening and things, they were always signed by David Boyce. And he's used some of these tactics with his other clients, such as Harvey W and other people like that. And obviously, he has enormous 
power influence and everything so he did get off pretty lightly in his depiction on the show but someone who got off even better than him was a Boyce, Schiller and Flexner partner and that's his his law firm and that's Heather King who was Theranos's general counsel. Heather has just joined us as our general counsel. Who had been a Boyce Schiller partner, former Hillary Clinton aide. <laughs> And she was very instrumental in having discussions with Carrie Rue, like it's her voice that you always hear. We're here today to do our part to help educate you on what I at least believe are some, you know, false premises upon which the questions are based. Kind of aggressively, at, you know, going after John Carrie Rue, and she's not even a character on the show. I really think that the character of Linda is just a substitute for her. Can I tell you a secret? I don't, I don't know. We don't have attorney-client privilege. No, I have a boyfriend. But it's interesting that they changed the name. So I don't know whether there was some sort of, you know, letters or something sent. I do think it's interesting that the two lawyers got off so lightly, especially because they were so instrumental in the protection of homes and the attacking of the former employees. And they definitely, it seems, according to Kariru and his books, that they were at least aware some sort of fraud was going on. How much they knew or if they knew minute details, obviously we don't know. But I do think it's a smidgen of justice that David Boyce actually didn't get paid for his time and everything that he did with Theranos he took stock in lieu of payment so really he made nothing from it but also he's already super rich so I guess it doesn't hurt him that much another missing character I just mentioned him briefly before was the chief creative officer and that was Patrick O'Neill he previously worked at Chiat Day who you know obviously was on the apple campaign and everything and patrick was probably the most impactful person when it comes to launching homes and theranos and getting her out there in in such an enormous way he clearly is very good at his job and and great at marketing and the whole theranos vibe and brand was his creation so i do think that they they should have shown someone like this in the show because that was a huge part of why she was able to to latch on to all these people because she was out there on magazines and her ads were on tv in between like Grey's Anatomy and Scandal like so many eyes were on her because of this person and he's not depicted in the show at all and he was a huge huge Holmes worshipper thought she was the greatest thing in the world and people like Patrick and David Boyce are the people that have influence and connections and you just wonder how much has gone on to leave these people out of the show so the last people missing that I'll talk about before we move on to revenue and Sunny and Holmes's trial is the Thera Bros and that was a group of Christian Holmes's friends from Duke University and they all were higher ups at the company. The Thera Bros were instrumental in faking some of the tests because Holmes used them to fake the tests which I don't think they got this quite across so well in the show they obviously got they were faking the tests in the beginning but I don't think that they they showed what they did to people like George Schultz and people on the board or who were really you know thought Holmes was brilliant because when they would come to view the company or see her she would have this whole fake things set up to to fool these people they would have the pinprick of blood or even sometimes she did do the venipuncture and she would put the blood in one of the mini labs and then take them on a tour or take them to speak to them and one of these therabros would come in take the sample out run down to the lab give it to one of the chemists to do it at the bench in the traditional way and then the 
person that had the blood draw would be told okay don't download the app and the test results would come in and she did this with like you know george schultz and all these people but she also did this to the journalist so the guy who wrote the fortune cover and all the other you know magazines that were touting her that's how they all got fooled and people like daniel young like they were all making software to kind of cover up the mistakes and to make the machine look like it's doing something when it isn't one of the therabros dan edlin did end up testifying against holmes in the trial and he also spoke to the dropout podcast when they did the whole elizabeth holmes on trial so before we talk about the trial let's talk about the revenue because I don't think this gets enough attention because while everything coming out was the big breaking, like John Carreyrou's story and stuff, I think that the whole revenue thing would have made them fail in the end, no matter what. So when it comes to Theranos' revenue and the architect of Theranos' revenue, there's only one man for the job, five foot five, Sunny Balwani. And Sunny was the one who made the projections. In the very, very, very early days, Theranos did have a CFO, Henry Mosby, and he actually was one person who stood up to Holmes and said, you can't keep faking these tests. And she ended up firing him. So Sunny took over the financials and he began creating like these increasingly crazy revenue projections. The year that John Carreyrou published his Wall Street Journal article, Sunny was saying that Theranos had revenue of over a billion when in reality it was a hundred thousand according to people who worked for theranos the financials were what were going to bring the company down in the end because they were burning through so much money at every turn and investors were beginning to get frustrated and the prices that they were charging for blood testings were not sustainable although sunny was creating these crazy projections and was a trash person it does seem as though he did have somewhat of a conscience you don't have feelings you aren't a person you're a ghost you're nothing you're nothing even when holmes did not Sonny spoke in numerous texts and emails about his uncomfortableness when it came to all the publicity that Holmes was generating and I do think they also didn't really go into a lot of detail about Sonny and and his life before Holmes like obviously we got to know Elizabeth a bit in the early episodes. Sunny was actually married before to a Japanese artist and not a lot is is known about his private life. Like even now, there was a stage where people weren't even aware if he was still living in America or not. And they do show in the show that he was, he was rich before Theranos. Like he did guarantee that loan for them. And he is one of those people that he is an absolute bullshitter. Like he was telling people he wrote like a million lines of code when he was at Microsoft and it would take some ridiculous amount of time to do that, like a hundred years or something. And he is someone who just got extremely, extremely lucky. He got really rich in the dot-com bubble and just got out at the exact right time. And sometimes when you see things like that, where someone gets like 40 million just for being in the right place at the right time, like, oh God, is karma real? And Sonny actually tried to tax dodge on that money. Like imagine being in the right place at the right time, being so lucky that you make insane amounts of money and then not even being willing to pay the tax on it. Like, He ended up trying to do this tax loophole and then the IRS was like, "Uh -uh, I don't think so, dude. And he ended up getting a huge fine and then he ended up suing the company that did the tax loophole for him. So he got even more money. But as I did say, I do think that Sonny is an absolute flaming garbage person, but I do think he is a person. Like, I do think there's a conscience in there somewhere like a little tiny like starved and abused Jiminy Cricket but when it comes to actual homes I think that she has that like psychopathy of 
I don't know, I don't want to diagnose someone in a YouTube video, but she, I think we really see her in that scene where Sunny and her are breaking up and she's just like, okay, bye. Like, I don't know, I think. And you're a mediocre software engineer. Okay, bye. As he says, there's nothing there. I'm gonna take a few of my things now. There's nothing there. And someone I trust is gonna take There's the rest nothing of it. inside you. So I'm just gonna jump now to Theranos going through their dramatic downfall. And Elizabeth Holmes did try a last ditch effort. It's probably the most important question I think anybody who's watching has about this. Does it work? Yes. And there was another CEO at one point. Part of her uh, settlement with the SEC is that she cannot serve as. Uh, a director or officer of a public company for maybe right. 10 years now so i don't i mean they're private but they are private yeah i mean well, i mean the first question is honestly what remains of the company right. i mean is it just kind of this pile of intellectual property or i believe she's gone back happens. asking for funds yes. from investors i went over this and the timeline for the fall in a lot more detail in my previous video so i don't want to repeat anything for people that have watched both if you want to, to see all those details, I'll link the video below and in the cards above. So definitely check that out if you want to know what actually really happened between the article being published and Theranos dissolving because there was a lot in between. Blood testing firm Theranos is formally dissolving, but that is not the final chapter in this story. The founder, Elizabeth Holmes, and another former executive await a criminal trial. If convicted, they face up to 20 years in prison. George Schultz is another person that got off a little bit lightly in this. And I do think, obviously, they're trying to be respectful. And then, you know, Tyler as well, taking his feelings into account too. Because the letter, as I mentioned before, that didn't go to John Carreyrou. Like, they, they never met. And it was when Tyler read him that letter, that's when George had started to come around and, and he, you know, he never apologized or anything like that, but he did agree that, that Tyler was right. And I did mention this in the other video, but I don't know whether this wasn't included because they didn't want to portray the character this way or because this really only just came out around December. And that is Elizabeth Holmes gave George Schultz over 2 million shares in Theranos and at one point each of those shares was worth $17. Those shares were worth over $50 million. So it wasn't just that he really believed in Holmes and thought it worked. There was also an enormous, enormous financial aspect to it. So I do hope that that is included in Bad Blood when they do the, the movie for that and Adam McKay has the rights to that. So I'm really looking forward to that because I love Adam McKay and Succession. So I hope they'll do a good job. I also wanted to mention there is a WeWork connection because I have talked about WeWork and Theranos on this channel and I'm going to be covering a lot of, of other companies and if you haven't seen my WeWork videos, check those out. I am going to be finishing up We Crashed when it ends in two weeks, so look out for that video as well. But the WeWork connection is after everything came out, they were actually given a hundred million dollar credit line in 2017 after everything had happened and that credit line was from softback funded fortress investment group which took a four percent equity stake and as i'm sure most people know softbank is the largest tech investor in the world and they are the the people who invested in wework and holmes and newman who was the ceo of wework were both on the same time 100 influential people thing and they were two people at one stage that were lauded as these messiahs and worth billions and everything and they both turned out to be absolute bullshit fraudsters when we do finger stick every time we use technology that is not commercially available i've never used commercially available lab equipment for finger stick based tests every finger stick test i had underestimated her willingness to bald face lie 
So if you like the Theranos story and you don't know anything about WeWork, I highly suggest it and I'll link my videos about that below. So to close out, let's talk a little bit about Holmes's trial. I did say I will go into an in-depth thing in Holmes's trial. If, if anyone's interested in that, let me know down below in the comments. And also just to plug that previous video again, I go into a lot more detail about the trial in that video as well. So again, check that out if you, if you haven't. They're charged with defrauding investors out of hundreds of millions of dollars and defrauding doctors and patients. So Holmes's trial had an enormous list of potential witnesses and there was so many people that wanted to attend this trial that people were getting there at like 4 a.m to get seats and there was like overflow and still people who got there at five didn't get seats it, it was really crazy considering all the people that wanted to go there were other people that Holmes and her defense team were literally begging to come and that was people that Holmes went to college or high school with that she hadn't spoken to them in like over a decade but she wanted to have like support in the courtroom so she would call these old like sorority sisters and stuff to come and some of them did actually come but they wouldn't give their name to the press when they were like asking them so that's kind of embarrassing. I've never seen this woman break a sweat really in public and today on the stage and she fought back tears. Um, we've seen her as the most put together individual, planning, it seems, preparing for everything that happens. This was a very, very different side of Elizabeth Holmes that the jurors saw today that we, up until this point, as the public, have never seen in covering her story. Another really bizarre moment of the trial was when her partner's dad, Billy's father, sat with all these journalists and gave a fake name and and as it was the early days of the trial he had a mask on and no one knew it was him he spent the first days with the journalist and the next day like took his seat with billy and holmes's family it was truly some bizarre behavior and the podcast the dropout did an episode on it so if you want to hear more about it i suggest that he was noticeably absent from the rest of the trial so the stunt doesn't seem to have gone down very well with holmes's defense team and there were many other strange aspects to this trial. Theranos, Holmes, the executives were actually accused of destroying the database that held all the test results. And one of the lawyers discovered a note Holmes had written to herself. Many smart people figured out M-A-D-O, but not you. And of course, most people think that this is... Bernie Madoff of Enron. Holmes's dad actually worked for Enron, weirdly. And most people think that this points to the fact that she knew she was frauding people all along. I feel, I feel devastated. devastated. Because a lot of people think that Holmes has deceived herself. Not for a moment do I believe that she lies in bed at night and thinks I was a swindler. I was a crook. I lied. Because a lot of people, including Theranos' previous employees and journalists that interviewed her, think that she has deceived herself. Does she think that she really was trying to, to save the world and she really did think she was going to get there in the end if she just had enough time? That's still the unanswered question, as Holmes never does interviews. This was real lunacy. I realized that there was something wrong with her mind, that, uh, you know, I don't know if she's uh, lying or if she's, uh, there's an unconscious uh, reconstruction, self-protective reconstruction of reality that's going on. But what is coming out of her mouth is not mapping onto reality as you or I know it. Is she biding her time and is she going to try and make a comeback or will she continue the rest of her life in privacy? I would put my bets on hearing from her again. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but someday. She got a taste of that Silicon Valley ultra, ultra high net worth individual life. And while her baby daddy is rich, he's not billionaire rich. My bet would be in the public speaking arena, maybe something similar to Jordan Belfort from The Wolf of Wall Street. I would say once she serves her prison time, which I don't think will be extensive, 
She'll reinvent herself again. And I don't think this is the last we've heard of Elizabeth Holmes. Thank you so much if you made it to the end of this video. You are absolutely amazing. And I would really, really appreciate a like and subscribe if you enjoyed it. Let me know in the comments, what do you think about all this? Do you think Holmes lied to herself? Do you think she's gonna reinvent herself? opinions on everything and if you want to check me out on social media my merch store patreon my other main channel it's all linked in the description box down below along with all of those videos and as always make sure to stay safe take care of yourselves and i'll see you in the next one bye guys